This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. When considering the reality of Noah's Ark, you've probably heard some of the skeptical questions. Like, how did Noah and his small family find and trap the animals? Then how did they transport them and house them all back on the ark? Because aren't there hundreds of millions of animal species existing on the earth? Or maybe you've heard the question, how could Noah have traveled all the way down to Australia to catch two koalas, then across to North America to trap two grizzly bears, and then down to frozen Antarctica to fetch two penguins? Though these questions are common, here is the problem. The scenario described is entirely false and it's based on misrepresentations of both the scientific and the biblical records. For some, the presentation of this scenario is an attempt to cast an air of ridiculousness on the biblical account by placing the huge burden on Noah to travel the world, to trap and transport millions upon millions of animals back to the ark. In studying the reality of the ark and its animals, we have to first base our understanding on the Bible's account. And of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark, to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Two of every kind will come to you. The first fallacy in the skeptic scenario is that Noah did not have to worry about where to travel, what animals to trap, how to determine male and female of each species, or how to transport each of them back to the ark. The traveling was accomplished by the animals under the direction of their creator. Whatever the geography of Earth's land masses was prior to the flood, and such a cataclysmic event, the topography was different. Noah didn't have to travel to a distant region in the south to bring back kangaroos, or to a far off region in the east to bring back pandas, or he didn't need to trek through some northern wilderness to bring back a host of different bird kinds. Rather, he was to prepare the ark for their shelter, the internal compartments for their dwellings, and the stores of food for survival. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them." The second fallacy in the skeptic's argument involves the enormous misrepresentation of the number of animals that Noah would have needed to take. While some skeptics have stated that there were hundreds of millions of species that existed, Others have gone so far as to say that the fossil record documents a half billion species or more. Both of these numbers are absolutely false and demonstrate both a misrepresentation of solid scientific data and a misunderstanding of the biblical time frame. The biblical history leading back to Noah's life did not take place over hundreds of thousands or even millions of years ago, but only a few thousand years and scientific studies of animal life do not document hundreds of millions of animal species, either existing or extinct. These wild extrapolations for the number of animals on Noah's Ark are derived from the assumptions of Darwinian evolution and the needed yet missing millions of transitional animal species. Even the seemingly lower figures, ranging from three to 10 million species, are substantially inflated beyond currently observed and cataloged species which only number in the range of one to two million. Yet for numerous reasons that we will discuss, the number of different animal species on the ark is nowhere near hundreds of thousands, let alone millions. But let's take a moment and allow the Bible to set the boundaries for our discussion concerning the animals on the ark. Prior to the flood, God conveyed to Noah very succinctly and definitely the scope of his plan to bring a global flood on the earth and that the ark would be a barge of salvation for both Noah's family and constituents of the animal world. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life, 
everything that is on the earth shall die. God's plan for the floodwaters was to destroy the pervasive wickedness that had consumed humanity, and in so doing also all flesh in which is the breath of life, such as birds, beasts, and creeping things. Thus the animals that came to Noah to board the ark were representative male and female pairs of only those kinds that would perish in the waters of the flood. On the very same day Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark, they and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah two by two of all flesh, in which is the breath of life. Once the appointed time had arrived, the animals of each specific kind entered the ark two by two for Noah to quickly settle them into their places, then usher his family inside. Once the appropriate members of all flesh with the breath of life was on board, God closed the single door in the side of the ark, and the cataclysmic event ensued. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered, and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. After the torrential forty-day rains and the breaking loose of the fountains of the deep, the floodwaters covered all the mountains across the entire earth, and God's plan and preparation for the survival of life was fully realized. When reading through the Bible's account, not only are the general descriptions of land animals given, birds, cattle, beasts, and creeping things, but three times the Bible tells us that the animals that were either saved or destroyed had the breath of life. Thus, when we survey the modern descriptions of the kingdoms of life, the Bible's account only describes life in the kingdom of Animalia. So Noah did not have to take representatives from the kingdom of the plants or the fungi, or the protists, or the differing types of bacteria. And despite many pages of skeptical critique, Noah did not take any aquatic animals, no algae, barnacles, clams, no fish, sharks, or even air-breathing mammals such as dolphins or whales. According to the Catalog of Life, which is an international database of taxonomy, there are just over one million known species of life in the kingdom of Animalia. However, of the numerous phyla in Animalia, the majority are either aquatic, such as the phyla of Cnidaria, Porifera, Echinodermata, and Bryozoa, or they are composed of creatures that do not fit the Bible's descriptions, such as Mollusca, Annelida, Platyhelminthes. And in fact, over 85% of all animal species are found in the single phylum of the arthropods which includes over 700,000 catalog species of insects. And although we may think of insects and bugs as being creepy crawlies, they were not required passengers on the ark, because they neither fit the definition of the Hebrew word translated creeping thing, or they do not fit the description of having the breath of life in their nostrils. The phylum that contains the main classes of animals that do fit the required biblical specifications is that of the chordates. Yet even in this single phylum of approximately 66,000 species, roughly half are in the aquatic class of bony fish, which leaves approximately 31,000 species in four major classes fitting the Bible's description. These four major classes are the mammals with over 4,800 species, the birds with over 9,900 species, the amphibians with over 6,400 species, and the reptiles with almost 9,800 species. These four classes represent the most well-known and studied air-breathing land animals. There is one more well-known group of organisms that we have not discussed, the dinosaurs. This group of extinct animals can sometimes be missed because of the confusion that evolutionary interpretation applies. As part of God's creation, the dinosaurs were absolutely real members of the animal kingdom. 
Although we do not know how or when each dinosaur kind went extinct, we do know that whichever kinds were alive at the time of Noah would have been passengers on the ark if they had fit on the Bible's required characteristics. However, let's address two major misconceptions. First, we are usually enamored with the largest of dinosaurs, towering over us at museums. The Brachiosaurus, Argentinosaurus, Tyrannosaurus rex, Stegosaurus. Yet these large specimens represent only a small fraction of dinosaurs. The vast majority were actually quite small, and the average size of all dinosaurs was somewhere between a sheep and a cow. And further, this average size is for an adult dinosaur. We are not told in Scripture that the animals had to be adults, so God could have easily had younger animals and dinosaurs arrive at the ark for Noah to load. The second misconception about dinosaurs is that there were millions of different species. Just as we have discussed the reasonable numbers of animal species, the number of named dinosaur species is less than 1,000. So we can easily add to our figures 1,000 sheep-sized dinosaur kinds. So far we have discussed the potential numbers of animals by following the species statistics of taxonomy. The modern definition of the term species can be a very controversial discussion among scientists. But the most popular definition states that a species is a group of individuals that actually or potentially interbreed in nature. In this sense, a species is the biggest gene pool possible under natural conditions. This concept, though, in its current form, has only been around for a few hundred years since the time of Carl Linnaeus, and represents modern humanity's approach to categorizing and studying life on Earth. Although the species is supposed to represent the largest pool of interbreeding organisms, there are many known exceptions to this definition. The term hybrid has been used to define an offspring from parents of separate species. And actually, there are three different degrees of hybridization. Interspecific hybrids occur between different species that are within the same genus. Examples of this include the canine genus, where distinct species of domesticated dogs, coyotes, wolves, and jackals have been known to interbreed. There have similarly been hybrids in the genus of bears, including grizzly polar bear hybrids, seen both in the wild and captivity. Additional examples of interspecific hybrids abound between species of felines, species of geese, species of woodpeckers, gulls, finches, chickens, crocodiles, and many, many more. The second degree of hybrids that we see are intergeneric hybrids, which occur between different species that are also from different genera. Examples of this type of hybrid include members of the bovine family, specifically the interbreeding between the bows genus, which includes yaks and domesticated cattle, with the bison genus, which includes the American and European bison. Cattle-bison hybrids have been observed naturally since the mid-1700s in the United States, and intentional crosses, such as the beefalo, have existed since the mid-1800s. Another example of the intergeneric hybrid includes various members of the duck family, specifically the interbreeding between single species containing the mallard, the baldpate, the redhead, and the wood duck. Other examples of this type include members of hummingbirds, warblers, swallows, and felines like the caracal and serval. Although rare, the final degree of hybrids are the interfamilial hybrids which occur between different species that are not only in different genera but also in different taxonomic families. Examples of this form of hybrid exist between guinea fowl and pea fowl families, between pheasant and grouse families, between the families of ducks and geese, and between the families of sparrows and finches. The important aspect to recognize concerning all of these hybrids is that even though scientists may have cataloged animals into distinct species, which in many ways is valuable, the classification still represents only a theoretical boundary that man has assigned, especially when it applies to potential interbreeding. What this means for our discussion of the animals on the ark is that the numbers of defined species we've mentioned are really upper limits since numerous species may have been represented by a single common pair rather than a pair from every species. This distinction acknowledges that the Bible's use of the phrase after their kind is not restricted to our modern term species 
and in many cases probably is equivalent to a higher taxon like genus or family. For our discussion though, we will simply use the species counts as an overestimate of the total number of animals on the ark. In addition to the common two of each kind, God further elaborated that each of the clean animals Noah would take seven of each kind on board. Though further identification of clean versus unclean is not given in the context of the flood account, the Law of Moses has lengthy discussions of the qualifications of clean animal kinds. Using these as a guide, the numbers of clean animal kinds was quite restricted, so we can easily account for the additional clean animals by simply rounding our numbers up. So all in all, here are the total numbers of individual animals. 12,000 mammals, 20,000 birds, 20,000 reptiles, and 13,000 amphibians. Before loading these 65,000 individual creatures on the ark, we need to address a couple of final but key issues. First, to conveniently account for the diversity in animal kinds and sizes, we need to utilize a reasonable average or common representative animal size for each class. This can be done fairly easily using the results from some scientific surveys of animal sizes. If we look at the mammals, we might think about the large creatures like elephants, hippos, or horses. But the biological surveys have found that the most common mass of an adult mammal is less than 10 pounds, which might sound small, except when we consider that approximately 40% of all mammal species are in the rodent order. An important point to mention here is that there was no requirement for taking the oldest or largest, or even having to take adults. Adolescents or juveniles would have been suitable in most cases. Similarly for amphibians, with approximately 85% of all species being in the frogs and toads order, the most common adult mass of approximately a quarter of a pound is reasonable. Likewise, there are only a few larger reptiles, like the Komodo dragon or crocodile. So the most common mass is also approximately a quarter of a pound. And finally, for the birds, their most common mass is less than one-tenth of a pound. What this means is that for convenience, we will approximate all of the mammal individuals on board the ark to be the size of a juvenile sheep well overestimating the less than 10 pound size. And for all the numbers of birds, amphibians, and reptiles, we can approximate them to be the size of a medium-sized chicken. Again, an overestimate. The second key question to consider is, what were the animal accommodations necessary? How tightly arranged were the animals? The Bible tells us that Noah was to make rooms for the animals and to prepare stores of food, but exact dimensions for the various compartments pens, corrals, or cages are not given. So engaging the space requirements necessary for the animals on the ark, there are two modern-day analogies that we will utilize. Modern animal transportation and modern larage or housing standards. It is important to first notice that neither of these two comparisons really fit the ark situation. The ark was not a short-term trip from point A to point B, like transporting cattle from pasture to market. Neither was the ark a long-term environment, like a zoo or research facility. The ark was a survival barge, which carried precious cargo above the flood's waters for a limited time duration. Thus, looking at modern standards for both transportation and housing simply provides a nice lower and upper limit for the space requirements. So how much space would the animals have occupied? As we have seen, the ark is an immense vessel with a total of over 100,000 square feet of deck space. In terms relating to transportation, the ark's size was equivalent to the volume of 527 railroad boxcars. When we consider the transportation of animals, the recommended densities for travel have been fairly consistent from as far back as the 1920s in the railroad industry through the trucking industry of today. Using published recommended capacities, a common dual deck boxcar could transport 240 mid-sized sheep. If we assume 12,000 individual mammals represented by sheep, then they would all fit within 50 boxcars. For our smaller animal kinds, a poultry boxcar that contains numerous levels of stacked cages could carry approximately 3,000 medium-sized chickens. If we assume a combined total of 53,000 individual birds, amphibians, and reptiles, then they would all occupy less than 18 boxcars. Thus, using the relative sizes and numbers of known species and the modern transportation standards, 
the ARCS animals would only occupy approximately 13% of the total volume, or 68 boxcars, leaving an incredible 87%, or 459 boxcars, for food, water, and additional living space. Now, we acknowledge that these percentages are based on relatively short-term arrangements found in railways or trucking, but they also match many seafaring livestock carriers that transfer cattle across large oceans from Australia to the Middle East or from South America to Europe. However, for long-term standards of animal housing, we can utilize the work of Professor Temple Grandin and other animal science experts for the recommendations of animal storage in research facilities. Using the recommended floor space allotments, a mid-sized sheep should have around 5 square feet of space. Thus, the 12,000 mammals would require approximately 60,000 square feet. The remaining 53,000 birds, amphibians, and reptiles that we are approximating as the size of a chicken would occupy 26,000 square feet at the recommended half a square foot allotment. These numbers result in approximately 85% of the ark's deck space being utilized for the animals. With each deck having roughly a height of 12 to 15 feet, stacked cages for the birds, amphibians, and reptiles, and many small mammals would have been easily managed and would greatly reduce the overall deck space needed and make caring for the animals even more efficient. If the pins and cages for at least the birds, amphibians, and reptiles were stacked only too high, the deck space required would drop by 13,000 square feet, which is quite a substantial amount. Thus, using the modern animal housing standards, the ARCS animals would occupy between 70 and 85 percent of the total deck space, which is 15 to 18 basketball courts, and would leave 15 to 30 percent for food, water, and living facilities, or between three to six basketball courts. Of course, even at the minimum of 15 percent for storage and living, that would mean 15 percent of the ARCS volume since the food stores could easily be stacked into grain bins, barrels, cupboards, water tanks, etc. So 15% of the total volume would be equivalent to a quarter million cubic feet, which is over 79 boxcars or two and a half Olympic-sized swimming pools. I know that we have discussed lots of numbers, sizes, and volumes, so let's summarize it. Considering an overestimate of 65,000 animals on the ark, we can easily fit all of the animals on board with room to spare. The reality of the ARC's animal accommodations would be somewhere between the short-term transportation comparison at the 15% and the long-term housing comparison at the 85%. If we split the difference between these two scenarios, then a more accurate percentage for the animal space required would be 50% of the total ARC. So a good estimate would be that half of the ark would be taken up by animal corrals, cages, and pens, while the other half of the ark would be living areas for Noah and his family, and storage for food, water, and other essentials. Now our goal has been to focus on the Bible's account in order to understand the reality of Noah's ark and to dispel all of the exaggerations and misconceptions. As we have seen, many of the criticisms of Noah and the ark have no foundation since they have ignored what the Bible has actually outlined. God's instructions for Noah clearly outline the specific kinds of animals that would be on the ark, and that God would bring them to Noah. Despite skeptics who claim that millions or hundreds of millions of animals were required on the ark, both the biblical record and the scientific data firmly reject such a notion. The ark was an immense vessel with a capacity perfectly suited for the precious cargo it would carry. Throughout the entire account, it is important for us to recognize God's role. While there were many physical duties that Noah was tasked with accomplishing, and the Bible tells us that Noah did all the Lord commanded him, God also outlined His role in the impending flood. Since God chose the ark as the mode of saving life, and God conveyed the original building instructions to His chosen builder Noah, and God was responsible for bringing the appropriate animals at the appointed time, then we can clearly see that the ark's structure was sound. Its seaworthiness was beyond compare. Its capacity to accommodate the passengers and cargo was absolutely sufficient. And while Noah and his family woke up each day for over a year on their floating home to live, eat, and work, the Bible tells us that God's providential role continued 
and that he remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him on the ark. World Video Bible School has additional Bible-based resources, including hundreds of video programs on various topics that are available free online or for purchasing on DVD. These programs, along with other print and audio materials, are available at wvbs.org.